Okay, welcome everyone. Today we are going to continue our journey of uh, Bhagavad Gita. And uh, Sashi is here. Uh, we will start from chapter 11. Okay. Uh, okay, go ahead, Sashi. Yes, thank you. Uh, Jason, thank you so much for setting this up and all you guys uh, joining us in this session uh, really is uh, uh, quite something. Um, uh, thank you. Oh, uh, I keep opening the wrong one. Okay. All right. <laughs> All right. So, um, if you if you go back to the very first lecture, long, long time ago, Bhagavad Gita, uh, you know, we live in a time of metaverse. You know, so there's so many things going on that keep wanting to pull our attention outside, uh, and it is only going to get worse. You know, we. Uh, one one of the approaches is we are going to blame the social media, blame the companies and all of that stuff. Okay, fine. Uh, that's not going to fix anything. Fixing that is not going to fix this. Uh, so the idea is uh, the directions are always like this, but there is one direction that goes about I. Uh, and that's really the focus here, at least uh, for me, uh, this has been, and again, you know, thanks, uh, Jason, to inspire me to go in this direction. Uh, it has helped me a lot uh, personally. Um, and uh, <clears throat> so I'm, I'm just sharing my learnings here. Um, I'm definitely not an expert. I am just uh, learning from uh, various different uh, uh, other swamis and, you know, uh, things that I come across. Uh, there is just so much uh, revival that... Uh, one can uh, think of uh, a contemporary take on um, this uh, this poetry that was written, you know, thousands of years ago. Um, and for me, the interest is not historical. Uh, I don't care when it was written. I really don't care um, the the divine aspect in the traditional sense of uh, the Hindu deity or you know, Christianity or whatnot, right? So there's, there's like so many, that, that's not my interest. Uh, my interest is not from religion perspective either. Um, uh, the interest is not even from, um, you know, business growth, let's say, you know, people people try to extract management skills out of this. So that's another thing. Um, so um, <clears throat> so the journey so far that we have taken is- uh, so, Sorry, Sasha, can you maximize your screen? Oh, oh, you want me to, uh, I see, yeah. Slideshow. Yep. Okay. Um, all right. Uh, so, um, so we we uh, we are going to talk a little bit about the past, um, and and then start uh, you know building into this chapter eleven. Um, um, so uh, chapter nine is. Yeah, really, if we go back a little bit, um, but let, let, let's just talk a little bit about, you know, I hope some of you guys have been with me. Uh, I think from here on, you know, I, I, I like what Jason said that, you know, we are trying to make it very like so that every every chapter kind of feels standalone, uh, valid in itself. Uh, while that is true, you know, we do our best, um, <clears throat> but to get the full, uh, you know, experience and uh um, understanding maybe um, uh, to appreciate all of it. It might be better for uh, you to go through the series and, uh, you know, um, come a little prepared with, uh, you know, your uh, your takes because it's really, this is a philosophical discussion. Uh, so it's not just, you know, me presenting it, but it would be something interesting for you guys to say, oh, you know what, this is what my take was on this or something like that, right? For, for that, you know, it might be better for uh, to for you to at least uh, cover uh, some of the past. Uh, so the two books that we have uh, uh, tried to uh, relate, uh, sorry, um, um, go back to is, uh, um, uh, one is the Mahatma Gandhi's book um, and the other one is Arbindo Ghosh. Um, and no, for no particular reason, really. I mean, Arbindo Ghosh's, uh, the easiest thing for me was how he breaks down Sanskrit, uh, the Anvayas and all of that stuff. So it, it becomes, the Sanskrit becomes a little more clear to understand. And then he converts that into Hindi and English. So I really like that. And uh, Gandhi is more 
accessible, I would say. Um, and, uh, you know, even though his take is more from the freedom fighting movement, uh, but it's still very relevant. And Gandhi is a very popular character. Everybody knows him. Um, uh, so on this uh, um, stage here. Um, <clears throat> so chapter nine, you know, one of the highlight that, uh, uh, that we should uh, remember, uh, uh, hopefully, uh, <clears throat> is uh, Krishna says to Arjuna, is this whole world is situated in me, yet I'm not situated in them. So now, you know, he, I, I will talk a little bit about how uh, this whole thing starts, but I'm assuming some of you guys have been with me for a while. So um, this whole world of names and forms uh, is projected on consciousness. So but what that means is, you know, they, they, so it's as if like consciousness is a strata and, you know, everything kind of emerges out of it, right? So that is the fundamental understanding of uh, the highest uh, uh, philosophy out of the Hinduism, right? The Vedanta uh, teaching. Uh, but also, uh, how can we uh, relate to our own day-to-day -day experience? You know, we open our eyes, our eyes are watching something, that imagery that is coming to us, you know, we immediately, uh, there are forms out there, and in our mind, there are names for it, right? So everything can be boiled down to a form and a name. And the, the foundation for all of this is consciousness, right? So we are, we are aware and we can appreciate the form and the name, right? And that's really, I mean, that's how I take it, right? And uh, they appear as shining beads. So, so he, he does give us a uh, metaphor there. Um, uh, so, you know, he, he calls us, it's, we are all a string of beads, and now if you look at the string of beads, we might just see the beads. We might not see the string that is going through all of it. And uh, he wants us to constantly remind ourselves that yes, we are watching these beads, but don't forget the string that it is hung on. And that string is me, he says. So again, every time you read me here, there's two ways to take it, right? Uh, one is, uh, you know, me is Lord Krishna, uh, that's a, that's a very superficial take of it, uh, but me is really me, you know. And if you start reading Gita as if you are Krishna, you have a completely different understanding and different take of it. Um, so me here means not just this me Shashi that you see, but there is a deeper uh, consciousness. So we, which is common in all of us. Our names and forms were given to us in this life by our parents or whatnot, uh, but before that we were something you know we so that is that is what that me that uh, krishna is talking about and he is speaking from that deeper level uh, to arjuna who has um who is troubled in his mind as to should i fight or not fight am i should i kill my grandpa my teacher on the other side my brothers on the other side yes duryodhana the the villain on the other side has lost his senses but how can i lose my sense and this is this is the 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 the, the discussion he's having with uh, Krishna. Um, so in this untransient, uh, in this uh, transient and unhappy world, uh, turn turn unto me is what Krishna says in chapter nine. Right, become my minded, my lover, my adorer. Uh, feel the unrequited love, feel its pang, and not just in thoughts or words. It happens. It cannot be forced. Right? So this is just some notes that I have uh, uh, written. Sacrifice to me, sacrifice her to me. Um, so basically, uh, here he is pointing to um, everything that we are doing, right? You know, uh, be it uh, praying, be it working, um, you know, uh, nine to five job or whatever, taking care of uh, our kids. Um, there is, there's a little bit of something that we are giving away, you know, so sometimes it, it can be discomforting. It can also be something that brings us a different kind of a joy. Uh, so there is a constant sacrifice going on uh, there is a constant offering going on um, but you know many times what happens is we forget when we are doing it we tend to position it as if i'm doing a favor on you little kid right or i'm doing a favor on you uh, the company that has hired me or i am doing so so there's this i-ness that kind of comes into play and that kind of uh, is the cause of our suffering uh, so what he says is one of the approaches is to when you're doing something, just assume that you're doing it for me. You know, it's it's um, 
uh, not everything can be solved by this material world. So that's another thing that he talks about, uh, that, you know, when we are trying to build something, <clears throat> yes, our mind has played a role, the materials that we use, raw material, all of that has played a role, but there's always something more than that. Try to appreciate that, surrender the ego to reach inwards, right? So whatever this ego is, you know, try to block it that way. While you're working out there, the, the journey is inside. Um, and ultimately there is that beyond the parloka. So the, the heaven, the hell, you know, where we say we point our hands upwards, really we should be pointing our hands inwards. Um, <clears throat> have, have me is the supreme uh, goal. Um, so, and then chapter 10 um, eventually starts into uh, this whole thing about glories and grace. Um, so this, so that your devotion uh, towards this, you know, this inner self versus the ego is pretty strong, right? Um, um, so Arjuna asks him, right, you know, thou alone knowest thyself. Uh, you're the one who knows yourself, right? I mean, that's true about everything, isn't it? Like, you know, um, I can only know myself. My frailties, my strength, my everything, I am aware of it. Uh, people might have a judgment about me, but I am the only one that knows me. And guess what? I don't know other people either. I don't know what is going on within them. All we see is a outer facade that they have put that we can see. So this Arjuna saying, hey, thou alone knowest thyself, he's telling Krishna, uh, who is talking from that deeper, deeper self um, uh, as to like, okay, you know, I can, um, oh, there's, there's somebody trying to enter. Um, how shall I know thee? Really, it's a question about like, how shall I know I, right? This deeper me, like just like how you are doing it, Krishna, how can I find my uh, within so that I don't feel the, this uh, uh, this uh, delusion that I'm feeling right now? Arjuna journeys from societal conditioning, right? So he starts out with this whole notion of what, hey, you know, if I'm going to kill these people, there's going to be so much uh, pain in the world. Uh, you know, um, women, women will be all husbandless and, you know, widows and, you know, child will be with parent, without parents. And uh, um, that's going to cause so much sin, uh, you know. So he, all of this is the social conditioning that Krishna is pointing him to. Like, is it really you or is it something that you, what you have heard? Um, uh, so, um, and then finally he says, you know, uh, at 10, chapter 10 is when, you know, when he asks, tell me more. He says, oh, I can see that now you're taking delight in me, which is he's understanding this outer shell that has been built is really something that society has helped me build. And I am trying to, um, you know, uh, comply with it. And now he has gone deeper, right? So chapter 10, one of the exercises that I had ha had everybody uh, participate in um, is to how to see this uh, uh, so-called God. I mean, unfortunately, God has been abused and misused and, you know, uh, used in wrong ways. And then, you know, we have atheists and, you know, religious people and all of that stuff, right? So here, really appreciating something that is so unknowable. You know, we can see something. How can, you know, what what is that something that, uh, you know, somehow... Uh, makes us feel, oh my God, this is so beautiful. You know, when that happens, you're looking at some imagery for a, for a fleeting second, you forget yourself. You forget all your pains, your ego kind of like just collapses when you see that. Uh, it collapses in the sense that there's not, nothing earth shattering happening. It's just that you, you kind of feel like it's just that, you know, the experience itself stays. And that happens to us all the time. So... Uh, when that happens, you know, appreciate that this is happening because I'm conscious. I'm conscious and I can see this and this is happening. Um, so, um, and, you know, so that that is that is what Vibhuti was, right, on uh, in chapter 10. Um, and um, identify the best potential among all of the existences as the um, self, as the self. When capital self, when I say it means that deeper self, right? consciousness is because of that that I can appreciate this um, and then ultimately this 
this eventually, this kind of foundation, this kind of training that we can do on ourselves will eventually bring us to an understanding, you know, things that we appreciate um, that we think are amazing, you know, be it, I don't know, like a jet or uh, a satellite or, you know, be it Elon Musk, I, I don't know, pick your uh, whatever you like, it doesn't really matter. Everything on this planet is all game. Uh, whatever you like, when it brings in you that um, um, forgetting of that ego self, uh, uh, and and you know you you just the appreciation is all that le is left there. Um, you start seeing that oh wow you know you start appreciating that this is it that this is this is amazing. So now you go from those highest points down to every other thing, you know? So, um, um, so that, that's, uh, so, so one of the things, you know, I, it kind of reminds me like how in India, right. When we were growing up, um, there was this thing where, you know, first of all, every street corner in India, there are random rocks. I mean, I think now, now with so much population and bigger metros, probably not the case, but back when I was growing in the little small town, there used to be all these little tiny, tiny temples and masjids too, right? Mosques all along the way, you know, uh, as we were going to school or whatnot. And uh, um, the interesting thing, you know, maybe it was a reflex that was uh, told to us uh, and we used to follow it out of possibly fear or out of possibly, you know, like we were part of a certain religion. You know, we, we had to just like, you know, uh, close our hands and, uh, you know, say, wow, you know, th this is it, right? So, <laughs> so that was a reflex. And uh, that, that is something that eventually is supposed to make us appreciate everything in the world, right? And that is the part that I feel like was lost in that fearful or a messaging that was filled with the fear of God type of a messaging. Um, and uh, that, that's a different understanding now I have uh, of that, uh, that particular uh, thing. Um, Okay, so chapter one kind of starts with that dejection, the delusion, uh, you know, bewilderment. And I think we all come to this kind of stage, right? Uh, that, oh my God, you know, what am I supposed to do? If I do this, I'm going to hurt this thing. Or I'm, if I do that, you know, that other thing is going to be hurt, right? So the, all of this kind of stuff we are struggling to, struggling with. And uh, this is the time when we kind of want to curse God. Right. And you're like, oh, my God, you know, what is what is wrong with you now? How, how can this be possible? Why did you do this? Blah, blah, blah. Right. Uh, but this can also be a moment for growth. Um, <clears throat> and, you know, uh, depending on what we choose to do, you know, we we uh, we usually take our decision based on the fear of future, worrying about the insult or societal ridicule or you know, uh, in some cases who believe in God, you know, they, 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 they will, they might choose a path, even though that's not what they believe, um, because they're worried about going to hell, you know, uh, they want to go to heaven, do something positive, I guess, uh, positive as determined by the world. Um, and, uh, and th this itself, that particular downfall can also be a God's grace, right? Seeing God's grace or uh, something good is going to come out of it is going to help you even during that time of low, um, and you can call it God's grace or even just it could be like, oh, you know, this is an opportunity for me to learn. Um, and uh, in second chapter, uh, Krishna talks more about like, oh, you know, the solution for this is equanimity and you know, looking at everything as one. And then he goes into this uh, process of karma yoga where he says everything you do, you know, um, you want to make sure that it's not biased by the goal. While you're doing it, if your focus is on the goal, you are, your level of uh, depth on while you're doing it is not going to be 100%, right? So, uh, so he chapter two kind of starts it and then three kind of builds on the whole karma yoga where uh, how can I achieve equanimity? You know, the first step. Today, we are all, we all have activities, you know, we work for a company, we, whatever, we do uh, some service to the society or whatnot, right? We make an earning. While we are doing that, what can we do um, so that, you know, uh, we can achieve this kind of inequality? It's not going to be something that will happen uh, just because we uh, decide to. It needs to be part of action. It needs to be part of our reflexes, right? Um, 
And then, you know, as he goes through chapter three, you know, he also kind of uh, uh, talks about, you know, wh why is this particular type of knowledge pretty ancient knowledge? And, you know, he says it was delivered by me. What that means is every person that has come in time uh, who has talked about a variety of deeper things, they're really the same thing. You know, if you think about it, if you really understand in depth what Jesus was trying to say or what Buddha is trying to say or Krishna is trying to say or anybody else for that matter, uh, you know, they, they, they really come to the come down to the same point of, you know, loving other mankind, you know, trying to be. Uh, what what not right i mean the equanimity kind of shines through all of these messaging and uh you know he tries to define krishna tries to define that as the avatar um and then uh pandit is among us there are learned people learned in not in the sense that you're uh, you have a degree from university uh, learned in the sense that you, one who lives the life with this understanding uh where they can see the same in you know this is the phrase from uh, uh, Gita itself is like human dog or an outcast because unfortunately there are people who are going to be pushed out of the society uh, for whatever reasons uh, you know uh, we see that today you know it has nothing to do with the Indian caste system there was an Indian caste system um, where there were outcasts but so do we have outcasts today you know we we sometimes do it unconsciously we sometimes society does it sometimes uh, whatever you know somehow that happens but for a pandit is one person who kind of sees or deals with uh, everything in the same fashion, right? Um, and yogi is one level up, up right? You know, where he's like, whether grief or, or happiness, uh, seeing everything uh, as self. And all of the, this can come through, you know, here these are single line takes of what I have seen. Um, and um, yeah. Uh, so he in seven, he says that, you know, why why are people lost like this? And this is where, you know, the whole concept of Maya and all of that starts uh, coming out. And then he says that this is the the hypnotic state uh, that I have created. <laughs> um, and the remedy is that you you need to understand that when the world is pulling you out and you say, I am doing it, I am getting angry. I am feeling insulted. This whole I, I, I business uh, is something that, you know, that is what is causing you pain. And, and you are taking everything that is out there very personally. And uh, that is why it is impacting you. Uh, the remedy is to take shelter in me, Sharan. Sharan is also uh, some uh, another way to look at it in our contemporary uh, uh, situation is that, you know, it's a way to, how to bring about a humility when you're dealing with the world, right? Uh, and uh, <clears throat> one way is, you know, uh, if if you do believe in God, uh, I don't care what, which one, uh, they, there is a certain level of that, like, oh, you know, I, I bow my head in front of you. Um, but that bowing feeling needs to carry throughout your um, every uh, action, every moment of your life, every dealing of your life, right? Uh, the feeling of Sharan. Uh, Smaran is remembrance of this, constant remembrance. You know, we talked about that thread and the bead uh, symbology there. Um, up to the last breath, right? So there is a whole uh, thing that he covers about like, oh, you know, the rebirth, the concept of rebirth. You know, you if you are following a certain desirous path and, um, you know, you, for, you keep continuously saying, you know, I'm being hurt or I'm making billions of dollars and I, 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 that I will be part of your state of your death. And the Hindu philosophy says that, you know, that is what is going to carry on into your um, Atman, the soul. And you're going to come back with that particular uh, understanding of life. And you're going to start at that stage in your next life, be it in whichever household, it doesn't matter. Um, and that, and that that particular thing kind of shatters the whole understanding, or at least the thing that we see about Indian caste system, where there is this four levels and all that stuff. Uh, you know, Krishna doesn't really talk it in that terms, but that that is the understanding that the so-called learned people at that time they kind of promulgated in the society. Um, but the idea is that each one of us is capable of being in any of those four stages 
uh, the the four uh, things that he talks about. Um, but if you come to an understanding of your life that your 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 eye sort of becomes little, and you understand that this is just my consciousness allowing me to see this, and you become a witness of every action that is taking a shelter in me. You know, this me is that inner me, and uh, me can in in the sense of bhakti or devotion, you can consider that as Krishna. You know, if you like Krishna or Jesus, if you like Jesus, it doesn't matter. Um, um, so smaran is that constant remembrance is what he talks about and then nine chapter nine uh he kind of uh, brings it all together saying that this is the swarup right this is this is what we are we all are everything arises out of self uh devote everything to me um and then 10 you know he's seeing the beauty or and unison with self uh, everywhere uh and then you know we are in chapter 11 where now uh, you know there is this wildness monstrosity apart from the beauty and unison uh order orderliness disorderliness wonderful bad sweet terrible everything everything he says is me um uh, and uh, so while vibhuti chapter last chapter 10 was seeing one in everything so as if everything is these different parts and uh you are uh, seeing um trying to see that one at in individual objects, right? Um, so um, the one unknowable. Uh, so for everything that you see, um, there is the manifested, that is, that is something that is tangible, that is what you're seeing, right? The action or the effect. Um, but one can also try to see that there are a lot of things about this object that I do not know about. And that is that unmanifested, right? And no matter how much you're going to know, there will always be something that you do not know. And that is that ultimately there is that one unknowable. And, you know, we, some people might call it God, some people might call it whatever, right? But, uh, you know, it, there is always going to be that appreciating that unknowable to be the cause and the reason also kind of helps us curb uh, this uh, ego that might get built up as we say, hey, you know what? I think I understand this. Um, so world is all about manifested causation and God being the reason, right? So one can assume uh, that God is, that's what God is. But we have hard time seeing, appreciating God in the world, right? So we, when we see something or we read a book, we understand something, uh, you know, we we kind of immediately, our ego kind of boosts a little bit. Oh, I I could do it. This is amazing, right? Um, but we we forget that there were so many reasons that were coming together for that to happen, um, and that should bring about some humility, right? So that was the whole idea of chapter ten. Um, it's almost kind of like a training exercise, chapter ten, for you to get into this uh, chapter eleven and everything that that is going to happen uh, going forward. Um, so. One of the things about our mind or our senses, our eyes, uh, they are geared towards uh, um, getting triggered by a change. You know, one something that goes from light to dark or edges. You know, we we sense that. Our uh, voice intonations, uh, silence, loud voices, right? So we we tend to notice changes. Changes meaning delta, right? You know, in scientific terms. So we can notice the highest peak, you know, or any kind of there's a peak or down uh, valley uh, in each uh, class of world objects, right? You know, the group of objects, be it like a peaks of mountains, you know, certain personalities or, you know, certain flowers or, you know, whatever, right? Um, and that that was that Vibhuti thing, right? Um, there is a manifestation of God, meaning there are a lot of unknowable things that are happening there that we do not know. Um, and But noticing that uh, is an exercise, right? That we can go through every day. Uh, we can appreciate these things. Um, and why can we appreciate these things, right? Um, a dog or a, a cow or whatnot, other animals. There's, there's something unique about us, right? We can actually 
look at something, we can appreciate it, we can feel happiness, we can feel sadness, we can feel angry, we can feel fearful. Or why is that happening to us? All of that is happening because of the fact that we are conscious beings. And that itself should give us a pause. Um, and uh, the, and that's that's the key that we forget as we are, uh, you know, wandering in this world, right? Um, and and that that's where that's what starts building the walls between us and others, right? And that that's that's the wall that we want to drop. Uh, and uh, and then everywhere is God potential is where we are going to journey into, um, or at least that's what chapter ten is supposed to build you on. You know, find the ones that you really love, and then you somewhat love even the hateful things like that all all need to be part of that right uh, everything every human has some speciality noticing that is vibhuti um outcome is an interaction one starts seeing good qualities versus issues so issues can also have certain certain good things that are coming out of it uh, that the ability to see that is what we need to inculcate um and Vishwa Rupa Darshan is the opposite of this, not quite opposite, but a little bit different way of looking at the same thing. Once you start seeing the same in everything, now seeing everything in this one, as if you break down the molecule, the atom, and even further down, and you realize that every at every stage, it seems like a universe in itself, right? You know, something vast. Um, and that appreciation, Vishwa Rupa, Ivishwa Roop is this whole universe, the whole cosmos, um, right? And now that is what uh, uh, this chapter is about. Um, so, but to get to this stage, stage, right? There's so many things that one has to go through uh, to really have that appreciation. Uh, there is, needs to be a little bit of a dedication, but this, this is true about any action that we take, right? You know, any any activity that we are working on needs to be some kind of a dedication. Also, uh, the tools that we are going to be using, uh, be it, uh, I don't know, Excel spreadsheet or <laughs> whatnot, uh, there needs to be a little bit of a surrender towards that tool. Uh, then we can utilize it, right? And, and whatever you're expecting to happen, we need to get that terroir ready. What is this terroir? you know, in, in the terms of uh, like uh, binaries and stuff, you know, they, 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 they toil, uh, you know, they put, put energy on the, uh, you know, getting the, the whole soil ready for the right kind of grapes to grow. You know, they call it the terawa. So we got to work on that. That is what we are building on ourselves. And it will be God's grace or something outside of our control that is going to bring about this uh, this uh, so-called remembrance of me. Um, and all the efforts are important, you know, like, uh, you know, there is rituals and rites in India um, and uh, people go to churches and, you know, people follow. I mean, yes, they all have a purpose. The purpose being that at some point, eventually you will realize that there's something more to this um uh, same thing that I'm doing every day, uh, how can I go to that next step, right? And everybody comes to their own realization. I, I don't think there's really a need for any external force per se, um, but um, just because of the repeatedness of it, uh, one gets bored and tired of it to realize that, wait a second, there's got to be something more than this. Uh, and that self-realization is uh, much more useful. Um, and what might come out of it is that grace, right? That is something that is not in your control. It will happen. Um, um, and um, <clears throat> and that delusion that's, that got you into this path is dispelled, right? Now it gets converted into hunger for knowledge. So this is where Arjuna is. Uh, and, um, um, and, and, and he comes there through a journey from chapter one, all the way up to chapter 11. If you remember all the questions earl earlier on that Arjuna asked, they're very much uh, sort of in defense of the current status quo. Um, and now he really like, oh, you know, Krishna, I appreciate what you're trying to say. Um, and then Krishna wants you to focus on Adhyatma. Adhyatma means um, the innermost, foremost, Adhya, 
Atma is the inner, right? Uh, secret of everything. Um, the highest uh, spiritual secret. Um, and um, uh, Vibhuti, we said that, uh, so so the journey to get to that innermost self, you know, the, 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 what, why does he call it as the highest uh, spiritual secret? Um, so initially he covers these uh, karmas, um, uh, karma yoga, right? But even before karma yoga, before Bhagavad Gita starts, uh, the whole society is completely imbibed in uh, all kinds of Vedic rituals and stuff like that, right? You know, things that will gain you an access to heaven, things will make you go to hell. That is all documented sort of, right, in Vedas. And that is the karma kanda, they call it, the karmas, all the activities that you do. And that is sort of um, a secret that only some uh some people knew and then you know people used to follow their advices right um then comes the yoga um the year the individual realizes that you know i need to bring some balance within me and be it physical balance then the mental balance and all of this in conjunction with god worship god worship in the sense that um i'm bringing a certain concentration uh in my life uh, when when I'm in that state of worship, uh, and that is that uh, the yoga, and then the highest secret is the bhakti, where there is the constant remembrance of this unity with oneness. Vibhakti, as we spoke a few lectures ago, is when you analyze something, you know, break something apart to understand what it is. Bhakti is trying to bring everything together, right? And uh, 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 so um, bhakti is also uh um so we 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 saw two characters right you know two important uh, uh players uh in uh, uh quite distinct in their approach towards uh this oneness one is mira mira is uh the the female saint uh, uh who falls in love with krishna uh, millennia later right um and um but the, her approach is her song, her dedication uh, kind of brings about a certain uh, loving uh, or a certain very peaceful understanding of life, if you will. Um, and then there is the path of Buddha, right? Buddha also came out of this kind of thinking and then Buddhism uh, uh, rose out of it, right? But Buddha is all about, uh, you know, um, uh, self, focus on self, um, initial things are a lot of penance based, but ultimately the understanding of the world, which is full of suffering and how do I address it, uh, right? And, you know, he completely throws away the notion of God, right? Um, while Mira, on the other hand, it's all about God, right? So they, there is a uh, emptiness is the mantra of Buddhism. Fullness is the mantra of Mira-like bhakti. Right, so there's a two different approaches. Nothing wrong with any of them, but depending on your uh, inclination, you can go either way. Uh, right. Um, so, um, uh, so uh, you know, I think uh, these are the verses that you know uh, that kind of trigger this kind of thought process. Um, everything is one. You know, uh, is it? Um, so that's that's the. Uh, curiosity that can be a trigger uh, that will help us start moving inside. Um, in chapter seven, there was, a, you know, we, if you remember the diagram where, you know, there was the Purusha and everything else is Prakriti. Uh, prakriti includes uh, our mind, our thoughts, our senses, our body, and then all of the objects in the world, right? Everything uh, is Prakriti. Uh, which is also another word for it can be Maya. Um, and be me, all, all this universe is formed, uh, by, sorry, by me, all this universe is formed. Uh, all are situated, no, not I in them. Um, uh, from my perspective, right, uh, he says, there is no Prakriti, right? You know, from God's perspective or from the consciousness perspective, if we ever uh, can uh, manifest God through us, uh, this prakriti is also just me, you know, it's just uh, how I perceive it, right? So we appreciate that the consciousness is letting me observe this in a particular way. Um, so this is the world of my own creation, 
Um, uh, so um, so the, the, this Prakriti is no difference from that inner deeper self is the final understanding. Uh, and in chapter 10, there, there is, uh, you know, uh, one reaches this, uh, he talks about unshakable yoga, right? You know, the balance that you're going to achieve is not going to be shaken by the world's uh, ups and downs, right? Um, uh, so I'm going to start skipping to some of this. Uh, so here is where he basically says, I desire to see it for myself, right? So the, the idea is as you go read chapter one through 11, 11 is where that needs to be everybody's state uh, <laughs> uh, where we say, aha, I want to experiment this. I want to experience this. This thing that Krishna is talking about, he has been talking about so many things. And this is where Arjuna is, right? You know, he desires to see all of this for myself, he says, you know, and the so-called divine form, right? Now, divine has so many uh, very uh, weird understandings that we have, uh, but hopefully, you know, uh, uh, here's a different one. Um, so he says, can I? Um, <clears throat> now, this is, again, this buildup, you know, it took, it took Krishna 10 chapters to bring uh, Arjuna to this stage. Right? So that definitely is a skill, right? Um, so this is also a skill of a teacher to let the student want to move inwards, deeper into any topic, you know, whatever topic that they are studying. You know, teacher can only handhold until a certain level. Now it is the student that needs to take that journey. A book can bring you to a certain place, but then it is your own journey. A book is not going to help you at that point, right? Um, and uh, so now see the everything in one, right? Uh, this is uh, with the divine eye. So what is this divine eye? Uh, so uh, Arjuna says, hey, can I see it? Um, and uh, Krishna says, uh, well, you know, you're going to need some divine eye, which is a different eye. Uh, so what we have right now is just a skin-based eye. It's a, it's a physical eye. And, uh, you know, we can only see what seven colors Uh and uh, we can only see it's as if, you know, we are watching uh, through a window, uh, a hole uh, into this world. And that's that's what we can see. Um, um, and, and another way to look at this is also, which is kind of interesting, uh, this being a poetry. Um, it, and also an, a reflection on, in ourselves is the, the these two were close pals, you know, they, and they were also brothers, cousins, actually, um, uh, for a longer, longer time, right? And this happens within us too, right? We have so many people that we know, um, but can we see the divine in the, even these closest people? Sometimes it is almost easier to see a divine in a stranger or even a rock for that matter. But when you know somebody so closely, can we possibly see something divine in our husband or wife or, you know, kids, friends, our office mates, right? Uh, that, that is an important exercise right here. And I think uh, this is where Arjuna starts seeing that divine in his own friend. And he starts feeling ashamed of how he has treated him uh, so far in some of the verses, later verses. Um, um, so many a times what we see is really based on our understanding. It can, the understanding can come from, not many a times, almost all the time, right? We only see based on, you know, the conditions, the so society has told you something, all of our education has told us something. And we look at the world and we immediately know, okay, this is a pen, this is a laptop, this is a cup or whatnot, right? All kinds of things. Or so this is a person, this is a mom, uh, this is a woman, husband, whatever, right? Um, so these, this is that physical eye, right? Um, based on one condi one's uh, conditioning. And this is also the duality in a sense, right? This is, you know, we start seeing the boundaries, the eye and the otherness. Uh, that, is, that is what uh, these physical senses that we have been given uh, help us see. Um, and also, so 
the same thing applies to our imagination. Mind is yet another sense. Uh, our imagination is only limited by what we know. We only dream about things that we have seen before. We cannot dream about anything else. You know, uh, if if a, if somebody uh, who lives in India grew up in India and has never really stepped out of India, um, it, I, and I'm talking about some really remote village, um, the concept of social security that is going to pay you past sixty is not even heard of. Like that, that concept doesn't even register to them. Uh, yet in America, that is absolutely a thing, you know, a given thing, right? So there is all these uh, uh, these things that, you know, are, are, even though we have senses that will allow us to uh, see something very clearly, differently, or uh, holistically, we only see the narrowness uh, or, you know, narrowed way of, na narrowed sense of things because of uh, the societal conditioning. Um, but to this whole concept of divine eye, meaning keeping an open mind, um, you know, try what that means is how can I see the unmanis unmanifested beauty behind what I am able to see? Uh, one needs divine eye uh, to see deeper. And you know what? Many a times, in fact, it might even help if you close your eyes, right? That's why there is all these meditation practices where, you know, you sit down, quiet, away from the crowd, uh, close your eyes, the point being that this is not how I'm going to see uh, the things correctly. And, you know, even in our day-to-day -day work, you know, you're working on some very critical problem, trying to solve, you know, some of you might be software designers or whatnot, you know. So there, you, if you've ever noticed, you know, in that critical time when you are really deep into your work, everything shuts down on its own accord, right? And that that's almost kind of like this notion of divine eye. Um, you're the observer and observed uh, duality um, exists, uh, yet no feeling of otherness. It's kind of like mirror image, you know? So one of the Swami kind of says, when you go in front of the mirror, uh, even though you're seeing the image, it just feels like one, you know, uh, despite there, kind of, there could be some crookedness in the mirror and, you know, your, your image might be a little bit distorted, all that stuff. But it kind of feels one, you know, the observer and the observed kind of feels one, right? Uh, despite the fact that the duality exists. Um, to get to this stage, though, uh, there is this build up from chapter two onwards. Uh, there is uh, purification, concentration, steadiness of mind. Uh, but this is true in general, like, you know, all the things that we when we say these basketball players are in the zone, right? You know, when they are you know, deep into their best uh, game, uh, there is something about uh, uh, some purity to, to, to it, right? And there's a concentration, the steadiness of their mind that helps them achieve that highness, a high uh, thing that they're trying to achieve. Um, uh, one sees oneself in the other, right? Uh, so they, this is eventually what happens is like, you know, when you have this capability, you can start uh, seeing uh, yourself in the other, and that's that's where this whole notion of non-duality uh, can be um, can be achieved. Uh, this is ultimately what uh, the journey is, you know, for Arjuna to be like Krishna, or for us to be like Krishna, right? Um, so uh, this is where there are some really interesting things that start playing in the poetry. Eleven, uh, as Jason was, uh, you know, me and Jason were talking earlier. This is almost kind of like the climax of the movie here, right? This is where uh, Krishna forms his, you know, this big uh, thing, at least. But that's the description that the poet has given to that whole thing. You know, it's kind of like, hey, you know, when you eat a strawberry, can you explain the joy to me? Can you? I don't think we can, right? Um, we can come close to where we say, oh, you know, it kind of sort of tastes like that or, you know, sort of tastes like that. And you, you can't really get to the essence of that feeling. Um, and um, so you can't explain that. But here they uh, they have tried to explain. Uh, so they, they talk about there are so many arms and there are so many eyes. There's no beginning. There's no middle, no end. Uh, so, in, you know, there's... Um, uh, this your image is facing everywhere. You know, it's as if 
you have thousand faces uh, everywhere, uh, right? Uh, so, but that is just a poetic way of talking about the enormity of that moment for Arjuna when he, I think, <laughs> when he closes his eyes and goes inward, uh, he realizes so far what Krishna has been telling him that it is really God only everywhere and um, it is the same thing everywhere. Uh, the enormity when it hits him, he starts thinking about all the possibilities at the same time and realizing that, wow, you know, this is this is all the same thing. And, and also uh, uh, there is a certain, like many arms can also, one of the Swami kind of explains is as, um, you know, we look at God as a benevolence, right? So two arms, a mother with two arms can love so much, but a mother with so many arms can love even more, right? So that's, it's just a poetic expression of so much love that Arjuna was feeling in that, in that moment. And the brightness is like thousand suns. Um, you know, infinitude is what, how I take that. And, you know, we'll cover that in more detail in this slide. Um, so the no, notion of God that uh, that comes about in the initial description as uh, Arjuna gets the divine eye is there's so many faces and mouth, right? Um, so the idea there, one of the Swami explains is that just you know, in that moment when Arjuna sees this enormity and then it it dawns upon him that, oh my God, you know, like all these mouths and eyes that, you know, we have been using, everybody has been using to do all kinds of crazy things. And, uh, but really it's God acting through them. And uh, so one of the learnings from this is, you know, maybe we should use it to, talk well and <laughs> and you know we can realize other people's hunger too you know when we see when we feel hungry we should be appreciative of other people's hunger as well you know that's again uh, sort of uh, uh, that Swami's take on how um, the disparity has happened in the society uh, super rich and super poor people right because we have lost the sense of uh, commonness, you know, trying to uh, empathize that, hey, look, if I get hungry during the day uh, 15 times, this poor man has not been able to feed his family nor himself uh, even twice a day. Um, so that that is, the, that is that understanding, right? So that is Arjuna at that level, you know, he was a king. You know, he also starts possibly coming to this understanding and he... Poetically, remember who is talking is not Arjuna talk, telling us this stuff. Sanjaya is having this telepathic <laughs> understanding of what's happening in the battlefield. And he is explaining it to a blind king, uh, the, the father of the villain, uh, Duryodhana. Uh, and how can you explain all of this stuff to a blind person? And, you know, and here we are millennia apart from when this event happened, uh, we are even more blinder than the blind person there in this whole uh, scenario, right? Um, uh, many eyes is the perspective grows on as well. So many eyes is kind of like, oh, you know, with one, these two eyes, we can see what is in front of us. Um, God has many eyes, right? Or even we can, when we um, uh, break down, it's kind of like reading between lines, right? Um, <clears throat> you can start seeing things from others' perspective, you know? So I can have a perspective of this problem and, you know, uh, maybe it's a liberal view, but there might be a perspective from the conservative, sorry? Uh, 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 yes. Fred has hands up to you answer. Okay, you. okay, sure, sure, yeah, yeah. yeah. I don't mean to interrupt you. Uh, I appreciate yeah, yeah. that. It occurs to me that at this point in verse nine, uh -huh. there's a significant change in the narrative structure mm -hmm. in that in chapters one through nine as i understand krishna has appeared as is really an avatar in the, in the human form of his friend so he's in human form and in one through nine 
Krishna predominantly dominates the conversation in that uh, uh, Arjuna at, they ask a question and then Krishna elaborates on that question mm -hmm. and takes up most of the chapter to do so. Mm -hmm. And then at one point in chapter 10, Arjuna apparently finds a moment of realization where he uh, responds to Krishna and, and says, you are the Brahma Supreme, the highest abode. And he goes on to, to say, tell me your divine attributes. And Krishna continues his description mm. of, uh, of himself. Uh, I am uh, I am the, the gambling of the gambler and the radiance yes. of the shines and so forth. Now, here at this point in uh, verse 9, it seems like there's a change where now the uh, discussion is dominated by Sanjaya and Sanjuya and, and uh, Arjuna. So mm -hmm. with one brief interjection, uh, there's Krishna as an interjection, but, but uh, so as I understand it, it seems like Krishna has revealed his divine form rather than simply being an avatar in a human form and describing his attributes. He has appeared to uh, Krishna and Sanjuya uh, in, in a divine form as himself. So it's no longer, he's not, he's not simply describing uh, the attributes any longer, but he's revealing um, in a visible form yeah. Uh, his attributes. So it seems like this is almost a climax from going from one all the way up to 11, and maybe the focal point of, of the entire Bhagavad Gita, but I guess that's to be. Well, it, it, it becomes focal point because um, uh, it is so dramatic, right? Now, uh, there is, uh, there's multiple ways to look at this, right? So far, so in, even, even in our lives, we hear things, we read things. That's not knowledge, right? So this is, this is just reading, understanding, hearing, you know, whatever comes through your ear. But the reality hits you when you look at it, right? When you see it. Now, seeing can be through these eyes, but seeing can be deeper understanding too. So this is a this is a much deeper understanding of this chapter 10, 11, this whole journey. Uh, so up to chapter 10, it is Krishna telling, Arjuna listening to it. But even being in that state of studentship is important, right? So that is the surrender, uh, the sharan. And also there is a there is a loving relationship between these two characters, right? And that kind of helps the discussion. And um, so there is an automatic like, oh, you know, whatever Krishna is going to tell me is not something detrimental. And uh, I want to have this conversation with him. And but there is also a bit of a slight resistance um, because it's not a innate understanding. Um, so this whole uh, dramatic uh, chapter is really the the inner understanding, you know, when we realize, when we really, really understand, like, oh my God, you know, we are this speck of dust in this vast universe. When that reality, reality hits us, the, the existential crisis that it should cause to us, it really doesn't hit us, right? You know, it doesn't matter to us. You know, we live our day to day. We are a husband, we are a father, we are a dad, whatnot, right? You know, we are playing some role in the company. So it's a distraction. You know, we keep finding distractions, distractions, distractions. Uh, but when we, when, when one comes to this moment of being Arjuna, Arjuna is such an important character um, that to come to that state of Arjuna is very difficult to all of us because world pulls us in so many ways. Uh, to come to that stage of Arjuna is really important to get this so-called divine understanding. Uh, now, this Krishna showing himself his divine form, sure, that's one, I would call it a li little bit a literal way of understanding it, uh, but a deeper understanding of it, it is, it's sort of like, you know, 
the 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 physicalness has gone away and the spiritual aspect or the inner deeper aspect has started arising into uh, arjuna and that arising is the process from uh, nine and uh, you're right sanjaya is describing because obviously arjuna is not there to describe he doesn't even understand he doesn't even know you know he he was a warrior he doesn't have the words or capability to explain it to other people so thanks to sanjaya who is explaining to us um and obviously these are characters in that play um uh, and you know somebody who wrote it right he he did a masterful job of bringing all of this together um but regardless i think there is so many levels of metaphors going on here um about how the transition from krishna to arjuna to sanjay to dhritarashtra and you know we got to find our place in these four characters and we are far away past this blind person right we are listening to this we are understanding we haven't reached to the stage of arjuna or or even sanjaya sanjaya would be the place where now you can possibly uh try to explain to others i'm not there okay so <laughs> uh don't even uh, think of that but um i'm i'm still trying to get to uh the um i'm 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 possibly at the blind man stage where i'm 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 trying to understand what sanjay is trying to tell me um and um arjuna is even more further stage where you have actually have gone through some kind of a deeper delusions and dejections uh, in life and you have really life has shaken you up and you start wondering what is this where am i who am i right and and then uh you know you can either take the path of whatever the society has conditioned you to do you know like this is the good path that you should shall, shall take or this is the bad thing to do fine you can follow that but you get to a point where you like start questioning and hopefully you run into some kind of a krishna or you know there is also a a, a phrase that later on uh, krishna says that the guru is within you so somewhere within you there's a teacher and you your willingness to listen to that teacher is important so willingness of this uh, surrender uh, kind of attitude is important and that can bring you to so many different uh, revelations if you will and chapter 11 is just a poetic expression of it right that's that's how i see it hopefully that answers your question but you're right it's a climax it's almost feels climactic because there is so much going on here um but to to bring it down to the level of our understanding rather than keeping it at a realm where um that's not like possible it seems very fantasmagoric right uh, for lack of better word um yeah can we thank, thank you that clarifies yeah. i have a second short question okay. i may okay. um in indian painting uh you often see a seated figure meditating with uh, his eyes closed mm -hmm. and then a third eye in the center of the forehead which is wide open is is that the divine eye yeah you got it so this is it right so these are the these are almost kind of the leather eyes <laughs> that we have been given windows out there um but the the third eye that opens up here is this you're right um okay um so our view is matter based right but if we can make it consciousness based so whatever we see out there understanding that that is the form that is coming through eyes but there is a deeper understanding that i might not be understanding right trying to keep uh, some room for um uh, something that you know you don't understand um so there is uh, throughout this whole rhetoric of uh, um um uh, the 9 to 14 uh, verses uh, you will see that there is an effulgence you know there is a brightness that keeps growing is what you will see uh they but remember why this is explained in such a dramatic way because it is being explained to a blind person he has never seen anything so he doesn't understand uh, how we might understand light now how do you explain light to a person who has never seen light 
since his birth. How do you even explain that? How do you even come close to even explaining what brightness is? Um, so this is where the whole notion of thousand suns uh, uh, comes into play. Um, uh, so the other the other way one of the Swami explains, uh, which I find very very enlightening, is uh, <clears throat> and the and the whole Hindu philosophy. If you look at it, it is marveling, right? In the sense that it really is. While the West devised so many things to experiment out there with these physical hands, you know, so many things, you know, so many resources that they had uh, to experiment things out there. Um, India, you know, back then, they started experimenting on themselves, not with drugs, <laughs> but just closing your eyes and just mundane phenomena as sleep or a very mundane phenomena of sun moving across the sky um, and the moon and the stars. What is the deeper understanding of that? Right? So one of the things is when I look at the stars, they are very tiny dots in the sky. And then you see in the night sky, there's the moon, right? Um, so moon is even more brighter than the star. And then, you know, morning you see sun. Sun is even more stronger, you know, midday uh, sun. But guess who is observing all this, right? So every time they looked out there, the focus came back to themselves. What gives me the ability to appreciate the star, the moon, and the sun? It's my eyes. And um, and our eyes are needed to experience all of this, right? Even that sun, that bright sun. Without this eyes, it's nothing. Yeah. Uh, so, um, so now the sun lights the moon. Eyes is as if eyes are lighting that sun. Not, not in the sense of brightness, but eyes are making that sun visible for us. And what is lighting the eye is the consciousness, right? So that was their explanation. So if you thought that that sun was bright, eye is even more brighter than that sun. And the consciousness is thousands of times brighter than that sun, right? So that's where that phrase of thousand suns, right? So when when Krish, uh, Arjuna, he uh, brings this metaphor out, he says, you know, you're, you're shining like thousand suns. Well, that that is supposed to represent like, you know, his journey to uh, to come to this understanding that, oh my God, you know, I can see all this stuff, right? Not, not, not the... Um, the literalness of the poetry but even in our real life you know he says as a human i could see all this the the, the whole notion of seeing uh, becomes like such a brighter thing right so that is that thousand suns um and uh, um now um one of the things about eyes and the sun is that sometimes they can be partial, you know, in how they view the objects. Consciousness is not like that, right? Consciousness is constantly equally lighting everything. And that, that should also help us understand our fundamental nature is equanimous. It is same for everybody. Um, and this realization that I am that light of consciousness, I am that thousand suns, uh, unknowable, right? We all are unknowables, actually, right? We only know each other's names, each other's uh, out of physique, um, and extremely bright, brighter than that sun, a uh, thousand suns, um, the multitudinous yet unified view, right? Divine eye to see everything in one is, is, Almost kind of like, again, the Swami says, it's kind of like when a piece of rock comes in front of a sculpture, he can see like, hey, you know, I can put this imagery there. If one is not a sculptor, not an average person cannot see that, uh, that beauty, right? And that is, that is also another, yet another understanding of this. Um, and, uh, you know, he goes on to sort of explain how a mirror captures everything in it, right? Be it object, a static object, a light, right? It, it is okay with it. Fire, it's okay with it. 
You know, it's not going to say, oh my God, that's burning and part of my screen is going to be all burnt. No, that's not going to happen. Uh, it's an image. Um, it also reflects the motion uh, uh, without any any changes in its um, outer layer, right? Um, that That is ultimately the goal of us, right? That's where we uh, should get to in our dealing with this uh, world. Understanding this world as a reflection via our senses due to our one consciousness, right? So consciousness, as we saw, our own consciousness is equanimous in nature. Um, that is the, should lead us to understand the non-duality all across what we see. Um, and th then th there, is, there is a phrase that Arjuna uses, you know, God of gods. Uh, there is a different understanding to that that I got from listening to the Swami, right? Um, so he says that, you know, it's as if the all of our senses, the touch, the eyes, the taste, the ears, you know, they're so important for us, right? For our fundamental happiness. Um, so if you if you read in other scriptures in Hinduism, it's as if these are the gods. We are a body of gods. And God resides in this every part of our body. It's sort of like highlighting the importance of that beyond just the physicalness of us. And that's God, right? I mean, God is something special than this human form. And this eyes, the whatever is sitting behind the eye that lets us appreciate what is out there, whatever is sitting behind the ear that appreciates the audio that is coming, all that stuff is kind of God. And uh, <laughs> it kind of, the story kind of goes on where, you know, when you die, um, these these little monitors that are sitting behind all of our senses are collecting that data <laughs> every second of our lives and they are going to report that to yama our our uh, lord of death uh, that you did this 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 so before even you open your mouth that's how they he knows so these senses are god's instruments uh, to deal with the world right so uh, the point being not it's the point is not that you be afraid of god that's not the point the point is that how can we use our senses to do something that is uh, decent and good right um uh anyway so that that is that unknown power that is helping me appreciate the world uh, through all these senses uh, that is the god of gods uh, he brings about and then you know the 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 first part of the whole verses is as if there's a big bang happening, right? There is a regal or royal creation out of consciousness, you know? This is Arjuna's inner awakening sort of, right? Um, and there are, there are interesting metaphors that are used. Um, now, they, this is the par first part of the whole thing is God is benevolent, God is love. And this is in many other religions, right? This, this becomes the highlight of uh, their... Um, uh, their uh, uh, God uh, realization, if you will, right? Uh, that God is love. And here's a picture that that comes to an average Indian's mind uh, <laughs> uh, that God, and then, the, then that, that is his uh, benevolent, uh, you know, like really large uh, uh, nature. Uh, and then there is uh, some scary part to it that we will talk about in the next uh, slide. Everything is occupied by God, you know, he says, uh, Vyapti. Meaning it, the, the way everything is occupied is uh, the Swami gives an example of uh, iron and fire. When they come together, you see this red hot iron. You can barely distinguish that old black iron nor the fire. It's as if everything is in everything, uh, sort of, right? Um, and now when, when one sees this, right, when one truly comes to this understanding, uh, the the reaction will be of fear, overwhelmed. You know, you are going to feel a bit overwhelmed uh, by this uh, this understanding because be, just the sheer vastness of it. You know, what we are used to is seeing maybe our family members, but imagine we are suddenly made to stand um, in front of a crowd of a billion people. Right, that's the overwhelming nature of this. That the weight of it that Arjuna is feeling right at that that moment, um, and uh, 
Um, so the, the the whole idea in that in that first uh, part or first one third part of this uh, uh, dramatic moment is uh, the realization that a lot of universe. Uh, <laughs> um, so there's an efficient cause, you know, a creator, but the material cause is also the same. So everything is sort of like deeply imbibed with uh, the element called as God, if you will. Um, so it's not a sort of like a potter sitting out forming his creation, but everything that he is creating, the raw material and the creator is all part of the whole thing. Um, and it keeps growing, right? The, the the deeper he starts realizing this, it initially is the beautiful form, then there's this multiple heads and multiple eyes, and the brightness keeps growing, an explosion, right, um, in, in his mind. Um, and then there is a sort of like the destruction that he starts seeing. Like this is yet another very, very unique to, um, uh, to um uh, Hinduism sort of, right, you know, where we see God as these two forms, you know, good and bad, um, is all God. Um, so some religions like, you know, I think uh, the Greek mythologies, if you will, um, or, or even Moses, you know, when he saw uh, God, uh, there is this notion of like, you shall do this, and I'm telling you, I'm ordering you to do this, right? Uh, so there's so, sort of like an unkindness to it. Uh, so, and then when Jesus comes into play, uh, there is a benevolence uh, nature to God. Um, and um, But here, uh, Krishna himself is both the sides, right, sort of. Um, and Arjuna is very afraid because what he sees in this uh, second third of that visualization is uh, <clears throat> a lot of these uh, uh, people that he knew of are getting sucked into his mouth, you know, like he's eating them and they're dying and they are yelling, they're uh, calling out in fear, right? This is this is the understanding of death, basically, right? Uh, and that is also, uh, Krishna basically eventually says, yeah, that's me, that's me too. Um, and, you know, so Arjuna, when he asks who thou art, that wearest, this uh, form of uh, fierceness. You know, I did not know that this is you. I um, mean, I, and even if you're God, this is never what I thought God was. And he prays him to like, please stop this. This is like scaring the heck out of me. Uh, show me that graceful uh, nature. Then he goes into the third part of his uh, visualization. But let's uh, focus a little bit about the second part. Um, are amazed and fearing. So everybody's fearful. All the gods are fearful of him. You know, our senses, as we are dying, they don't want to give up. They don't, we just want to like see, we want to hear, we want to whatever, you know, all kinds of se uh, senses that we have had. Everybody's afraid of death. Um, um, but there are two forms of death that one of the Swami kind of explains really nicely. So there is, he, Arjuna also says that there is, I can, I can see that it is as if water is rushing towards the ocean. The rivers are rushing towards the ocean and the river is going to get vanished when it hits the ocean. Now, this is the path where he sees uh, his grandfather. who is He respects them, right? He respects his grandfather, his teacher, yet they're fighting from the other side. These are so-called, these are good people. You know, they're respectful people. Um, and they have chosen their, duty in their life as of the highest eminence in their life, be it for uh, evil. <laughs> um, but they say that we have been called upon doing this and we are going to follow it as if it is thy will, Lord's will. I'm going to do it. I'm not going to question this. You know, that was the nature of that grandfather or the teacher is how one can see this. And for these people, death is as easy as a river meeting the ocean. It's a bit more pleasanter form. It's as if almost that river wants to meet the ocean. Um, and um, so uh, the and then there is the other metaphor that uh, comes across is the, there are these moths rushing towards flame and they're getting burnt. And this is, um, uh, Swami says that 
this is kind of like a lot of us who are clinging to this life or clinging to our desires, the sensual desires, and we feel uh, you know, we 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 don't even realize that you know these these senses are driving us, pushing us towards some destruction, and we are happily walking into the destruction, and then we get completely destroyed uh, in that in that attainment or lack of it uh, of that particular desire, right? So there's these two forms of death uh, that come across in this uh, uh, metaphor. Um, so as I said, right, Hinduism proclaimed both good and evil are God. Um, and uh, so, and, and the other way to look at this is, can we, this is the exper exper experiment that we can do on ourselves, is we can easily see God in good things, you know, as we saw in chapter 10. But the ultimate challenge is in every evil that we see, we want to see something good, right? And that, that is going to help us circumvent that evil. Even though we might get destroyed, but and that destruction, the fear of death is fundamental. That's going to be there. But even getting over that, understanding that we don't have control over it uh, is important, right? Um, so um, there, there's a little bit of uh, discussion around determinism. Uh, way back then, <laughs> uh, in, in this uh, particular poetry, uh, in chapter 11, um, and the, the idea of determinism that, hey, everything is out of your control. It is all predetermined. The point of that is not so much that you just sit and do nothing. That's not the point. The point is that when you are constantly out there trying to create that future based on some past, you forget to live in the now. So you're constantly moving, even though you achieve something, you're that achievement is not enough. You are now looking for something else. So you are constantly, look, I can fix that. I can fix that. I can fix that. I can fix that too. And you're constantly, your goals are moving forward and um, and you're constantly moving away from yourself. And then that builds your ego. Like, hey, I did this. I did this. I did this. And I did that. And this I becomes stronger and that can be destructive self-destructive and you know the all of this uh you know if you look at the all the developments uh, that have happened they have caused all kinds of newer problems that we did not know about um and we can see that that when technology or anything that happens with this outward looking approach it comes with a whole uh, gamut of issues right um uh, the determinism that Krishna is pointing to here, where he's saying, look, Arjuna, you better go fight out there. Don't worry about killing them. Because guess what? That's already been decided. They have already been killed. They are here on this battlefield by their choice. And they are going to fight regardless of you. So they are going to die, no matter if you're going to be there or not there. So you just be there and just you, you this is your destination. Uh, this is your destiny. And uh, then there is this whole notion of uh, Kal uh, that he explains, you know, when uh, there is this fearful nature of him, uh, the death and all of that stuff. Um, the a very uh, nice way to look at it. There's a scary way to look at it, which is our uh, time always ends for all of us. You know, we die and then there is destruction, blah, 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 right? Um, but every object that gets created, you know, uh, there is an innate built-in inspiration <laughs> uh, to move toward destruction, you know? So everything rots. A new apple, banana, a rock, plastic, everything degrades. And, you know, in science, there's a word called as entropy. Um, so this was dealt back then in this uh, uh, poetry, right? Um, there's a balance of gunas. You know, we talked about the three gunas back then, sattva, rajas, and tamas. There's a balance, but then it gets disturbed and that builds the whole notion of maya and time. And that's how space comes out of it. And now suddenly this whole thing starts 
floating and the world is created, right? Uh, that's one way to look at it. And that's that's the Kala. Kala is also like, you know, uh, the journey of time. And how did this time come about? Time, we come out of time, uh, right? Um, and And we are also, if you look at it at the scale of us, day-to-day -day us, um, our I am actions set into motion our future, whatever we are going to see. So it's as if there is a predetermined then destiny that we have set into motion, knowingly, unknowingly. This is when, you know, when you're fully mindful, right? Buddha talks about this mindful action is going to help you have that foresight of what is coming. Most of us don't have that, right? Um, so, and then Krishna says, all these people that you are worried about dying, guess what? They are marching towards me of their own volition. They're doing it by choice. Um, and also, I want them to come towards me. And, you know, we all are walking towards death, right? You know, if you think about it, every moment we are just <laughs> journeying towards it. Uh, so he calls him, calls upon him saying, slay by me who are already slain, Drona, Bhima, all of these guys that you, you call your loved ones. Because remember, Arjuna had no qualms about killing Duryodhana, but he only had doubts when he had to kill his loved ones. And he says, go ahead, kill them because they are already killed. Uh, did somebody have to say something? Fred? Yeah, I have my hand up. Um, the, the first, uh, let's see, the 32 starts with, uh, I am time, the destroyer of all, as says Krishna, mm -hmm. which is really incredible uh, verse. But normally we think of uh, Shiva as the goddess destroyer. So what's the relation ah, yes. between Shiva and Krishna? Yeah, yeah, good question. Okay, so remember, uh, there is Brahma, uh, Vishnu and Mahesh, uh, Shiva. Shiva, other name is Mahesh. Uh, so Brahma is the creator and then his job is done. Then Vishnu is the sustainer and uh, Shiva is the destroyer. But all of this thing is happening in the realm of consciousness. You know, so in that realm of that consciousness, that is the Paramatma or the foremost being even before brahma vishnu and uh, shiva were created so it's as if saying that brahma vishnu and mahesh are um, again metaphors to understanding creation sustainability and destruction but all of this is happening coming out of that one single thing so the real nature of god is all three of them that's the point and that's what Krishna is trying to say. And Shiva and uh, Brahma and all of these different names are just devices for us to really understand that deeper Paramatma, right? And that that's uh, that's really uh, the point of it. Uh, so yeah, some people like to call, these are different names, right? You know, different people have come up with different names. All right, so I don't know, I think we are probably running late. So let me rush through this. This isn't call for, yeah, obviously, you know, when, when he's saying this, go kill them. It's not a free or free for all type of violence or the purge type of a thing. Um, so here the point is that, you know, the war is happening. The soldiers are here. They're going to fight regardless of Arjuna not being there. Nobody's even going to notice if Arjuna ran away. Um, and Arjuna is going to be the warrior that he is, no matter where he goes, you know, even if he becomes the sannyasi or the yogi or whatnot out in the mountains, he's probably going to do some warrior-like act regardless of, uh, you know, him not being in the battlefield. That's the whole point. So follow your inner, first of all, understand. So, you know, I think the whole thing in Gita is really interesting. You know, we, uh, we have an interesting understanding of religion uh, and we have so many religions on the planet now. Um, and um, there are some important religions. Um, and um, uh, in Hinduism, uh, you know, we think it's a religion, like this is coming, this is considered as a religious text. I don't see it as a religious text, right? So here, the Indian word for religion, you know, some people say it's dharma. 
So dharma and religion, some people think it's synonymous. It really is not, right? Uh, so Krishna in this text very clearly says that there are certain laws that every being follows. Not follows, but there's, they are out of their control. You know, these laws are acting by themselves. You know, they, they are just there. So for it is for all of us to understand what is my uh, inclination. That is my dharma. That is my call in this um, existence, in this being. You know, this is my calling, if you will. Right. And understanding that is important. That's what Krishna is trying to help Arjuna understand. This warrior being the warrior is your calling. Don't think that you can just like shut down everything and run away from the world. And the, the very important teaching here is that how can you be a renunciate while you're in the world? So you are as if getting the dividends from both the things. <laughs> you get the benefits of being a renunciate, but you can also benefit from the this whole transaction in the world, right? So I'm going to skip on this. I, I've already spoken about that. I've spoken about that. Sorry. Um, <clears throat> and, and then, you know, 35, 30, 46 year, Arjuna is really apologetic. It's like, okay, he has already seen the three forms and now Krishna is back to his loving nature. That is the third form uh, that everybody likes with his, you know, the, the one form that every Indian likes is the four arms, right? Forearms really just mean double the love of the love I got from my mother. That's what I'm getting from uh, this uh, deity, uh, the God. So you put four arms, this beautiful flute playing Krishna, right? Um, but this is where Arjuna is going into his apology tour here from uh, 15 on, uh, sorry, uh, from... Um, uh, uh, 35, 46, right? He's saying, man, I didn't even realize that you were uh, this and this. You know, I always thought you were just my friend. I've said horrible things to you, uh, jokingly, blah, 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 right? So he's very apologetic to all of that, all of this. And this is also a call for us to try to see, like, you know, maybe we are missing out on some deeper thing of this person that we are mistreating or we are taking for granted, uh, Arjuna finally is able to see God and his friend, right? So hopefully we all come to an, that kind of understanding with every dealing that we have, right? Um, um, so we, many a times, you know, we we take our closest ones for granted, right? It is very hard to, you know, not uh, do that because, you know, we take that, you know, because they love us and I love them, I can say whatever the hell, the hell I, that comes to my mouth. Um, uh, and we tend to treat them most unkindly. Um, and then, you know, what if we suddenly see God in them? <laughs> we, we, you're talking with a friend uh, who comes across as this really poor person, blah, blah, blah. And we are talking down to him and we suddenly realize, oh my God, he's a prime minister of this country. Wow. Didn't even notice that. That suddenly will change our attitude towards him, isn't it? Our whole demeanor is going to change when we learn that someone else's title. And that is what happened here to a uh, friend. So why not start from the get-go assuming that that person is a god? That is going to put you in a much more better uh, place with this person had he been god. And even if he's not god, if he is going to do some service for you, isn't he going to serve us better if you are treating him well? Um, so seeing the one in is a rare daunting experience, right? You know, Krishna basically here is saying what you have seen is something very unique, Arjuna, and neither Vedas nor sacrifices nor gifts and all of the things that you have done. Remember, uh, Arjuna is known to be this tapasvi, meaning he was known to do a lot of penance and he gets these uh, amazing boons from God, blah, 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 right? Austerities and all of that stuff. So he says all of that was great. This that you have achieved is the ultimate. And here, one thing we can learn is we can go read in depth about physics. We can go read in depth about mathematics, science, everything. But understand that this, this type of visualization, not, not in a literal sense, but understanding of self, understanding of our place in the world, and understanding our connection with other people is the most important understanding not physics or math or science, while they are important, ultimately you want to come back to this. 
Um, and then, you know, he kind of talks here about uh, how there are two paths. You know, one is about just jnana, uh, and, but this remembering of me, bhakti-based path, is the most um, uh, important. Ultimately, that is what is going to uh, sustain you. Uh, and chapter 12, remember these are blocks of six, six chapters, right? The first six almost kind of deal with our actions in the world. Second deal with the bhakti or the adoration of God or uh, this um, uh, bring about a humility and including everybody, right? That That is the the these six chapters. So we are at chapter 11. Chapter 12 now goes into this whole in depth of what bhakti is supposed to. And that's gonna be the climax of this six chapters. And then the next six chapters are going to be the ultimate understanding, the jnana, the, the ultimate knowledge, right? So that's what the second, uh, the last six cha chapters are gonna be. And in everything that we do, you know, we want to have this attitude of thy will be done. You know, so this has been also said in Christian uh, books, right? In any other Muslim uh, books as well, um, any religion has this um, uh, have freeing of attachment without any enmity, he says, right? Acceptance of everything in, in the last verse, um, seeing everything as one is an... Uh, so th this whole thing that is going to happen, that has happened to Arjuna, that will happen to us, is going to be an external happening. What that means is that we cannot force God, like say, hey, look, man, I read so many things. I've finished Gita like 500 times and I still don't have this, this vision that you gave to Arjuna. <laughs> uh, that kind of attitude is not going to get you this. Uh, so uh, this is going to be something where it is going to happen at its right point, uh, right time. Um, seeing everything as one or the vastness uh, can be overwhelming. It, it is going to be that, right? Many of us, uh, go insane, uh, might grow handicapped to deal with world, right? So there could be a point where this understanding might make us almost kind of not very useful in this uh, capitalistic world that we live in. You know, we are not really adding to the profits of the companies that we are working for. Uh, while that might be true, you are going to get to the point where, remember, Krishna Nobody can be as materialistic and worldly like Krishna. If you ever read about Krishna in the books, he is the most fun person ever. He's nothing like an austere, uh, stern looking, any nothing of that sort. You know, if, if you saw some of his, uh, um, his past, right? So the idea is that you're going to take this journey, but you're going to have this period where you kind of feel completely disconnected from the world. <laughs> but you have to get over that and connect, reconnect to the world. <laughs> um, yeah. All right. So that's going to be the foundation for our next uh, chapter. But uh, this is where I'm going to stop. So we have 15 minutes. <laughs> <clears throat> All right. Uh, uh, Saren has a hands up. Yeah. Go um, ahead. Yes. I had a question from a few uh, verses before. We were really talking about getting your mind and body ready, and the terroir um, analogy worked really well. And then the very next thing that we say after that is you want, like, we're talking about it being effortless and not ego led. How do we reconcile the two? On one end, we are saying we need to get ready, like, we need to get the system ready for it, which means effort um, and the way I understand it, it is after that comes like, like an effortless leap where maybe it is an external aspect that makes it happen so is it fair to like understand this as you have to put in the effort first but somehow not associate your ego with it too much or expect much out of it absolutely yeah you got it right I think the efforts you know sometimes when people come from the non-dual Advaita Vedanta point of view they find these rituals that uh Indians or anybody goes through like, you know, everybody, you know, some some people go to church in the morning on Sunday um, and all of that stuff, you know, people might ridicule that. 
or even praying to God, doing the rites that are required. Uh, some people just do it. Um, uh, they might find that completely unnecessary, but that's that person's journey. And um, for us to uh, come to that final understanding uh, and just take that essence and stick with that, um, what you lose by that is that you realize oh, wow, that's the understanding. And that's so easy. I got it. I got it. Here, the I becomes much more important. But if you were taking the effort, and you know that's why sometimes I kind of feel like reading all this literature, reading everything, understanding and all that, it's <clears throat> almost a handicap, if you will, in the sense that when we read, we feel like we understand. And that's, we know, you know. But if there was an illiterate person, and there are so many examples of that in Indian uh, history, where these illiterate, they became the most uh, revered in the society, and they became the most reached people, if you will, because they were doing their mundane tasks. You know, there was a uh, chamhar, you know, what do you call them? A, a cobbler. Um, you know, all he did was just mend people's shoes, um, uh, raidas. And he became a masterful, eloquent uh, poet. And, you know, he talked about these very high reaching philosophies in his uh, simple poetries. Same can be said about Mira, even though she was a queen, but she gives her whole kingdom and walks away. And then she pretty much all her efforts are about loving Krishna. And that, that oneness, the one concentration is the fundamental answer there, right? The devotion and the that concentration kind of takes away your uh, attention from I to that. And that that is the main thing. It's not about achieving, um, but if the, if the efforts are going to tire you of your own I, then the efforts have done their job. And when it happens, it is going to happen. You, you're not going to realize it. And, you know, even if you realize it, you're not going to go around asking for certificates, right? That is going to be completely lack of realization. <laughs> uh, Thank you. That I, makes a lot of sense, especially the aspect about like when the effort tires the eye, then the effort has done its thing. Thank you. Yeah. Cool. Anyone else? Yeah, I think I think if you guys have not uh, gone through the past uh, uh, playlist, I would highly recommend you go through that uh, and uh, come to chapter 11 uh, with that whole understanding. I think that chapter 12 onward then becomes a little more interesting journey. Uh, Klim. Hi. Um, yeah, maybe not quite related question but still on a similar topic um what happens with the individual um ego after mo moksha no um yeah ego is the exact opposite of moksha right so the 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 ego is completely vanished um uh, the idea the ego in the sense of this whole i am i will I am getting angry, I'm getting fearful. The state of moksha is where you say that I am observing that I am becoming angry. I am observing that I'm becoming fearful. I'm observing that my hand is bleeding. Or, you know, so I becomes the witness of every event that is happening to you. And that whole idea of becoming a witness sort of separates you from you. And that separation itself kind of allays away your fears or the pain that it might be causing you. And uh, the state of moksha or liberation, if you will, liberation is, moksha basically literally means liberation. Liberation from what? Liberation from this sense of day-to-day uh, -day pain, day-to-day -day fear of death, you know, all of our pains, if you think of it deeply, 
they are about destruction. You know, that is why, you know, we don't want certain party to be in power. We political affiliations, you know, we hate our neighbor, you know, we want to have guns, all that stuff, right? Because I don't want to kill myself. I don't want to be destroyed. Uh, and that is binding. So we are sort of imprisoned by that fear. And moksha is like letting go. Everything is gone. So what you're saying is, whatever is happening to me, it's out of my control. But you know what? This I who is observing this is me, not this body. It's fine for it to be destroyed, not this property. Let the property be destroyed, doesn't matter. Or grow, for that matter, right? The, these people who feel liberated, they can be amazing business people. You know, They will have the best way of dealing with people. Uh, bring people together. Uh, Krishna was just that. He was the most uh, interesting uh, politician. Uh, you know, uh, a lot of people brought him uh, to kind of, you know, bring about alliances. Um, so all kinds of things, right? And he is a moksha, uh, uh, a liberated person. Uh, so, um, yeah, uh, hopefully that answers your question. So, so, so just, just to clarify, does the ego go away or it still remains so what happens with the individuality i guess the the human's individuality yeah so individuality is a way of saying i am different from you so that that notion of i different from you will go away i for transactional thing is fine you know like you know i'm going to keep my space you can going to keep my space all of that but when it comes to empathizing with you it will be a much more stronger feeling of us. You know, as if like, let's say something happens to your son, uh, you, you are out in the park and your son falls off of the slide. Uh, uh, you suddenly run there, right? You're like, oh my God, what happened? Now, if another kid falls off of the slide, that you're waiting for that other guy's parent to show up and help that kid. You don't have that same connection, that, that, that thing is not going to be there. But when it comes to this kind of egoless moksha, the individuality that you're talking about, the individuality which is only focused on your set of things will now become of this whole world. So the empathy is going to grow. The, the amount, that's why it is called as the Brahman nature, which is the vastness. So you are not this, but you are all this. Okay. All this is you, right? So, so if I hear you correctly, um... The individual I still remains, but it sort of becomes more of an enlightened I or more illumined. Yeah, or uh, or an infinite I, if you will, a larger I. It's okay. kind of like right now my I involves maybe my wife, my child, my close friend, my house, my car, right? Those are the or my country, my party. Now suddenly everybody, you 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 see uh, some evil happening. You go, aha, you know. It is interesting. I mean, it's just you right. can so, connect with it differently. Yeah. So I was because I was curious to to understand if it dissolves and mm -hmm. because everybody's everybody's talking about and you know maybe incorrectly, but a lot of people are talking about this certain realization of the let's say divine nature, where it depending on how you understand it, it could mean. Well, then, then you become like om omnipotent, as, you know, as a, as God. Mm -hmm. And then here, I think what you're saying is, well, no, re not really. You're still you, you're old you. You're just not, you know, suffering that much maybe or not, um, Got it. you know, right? Maybe. So it's basically, it's, 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 it's an old you. You does not go away. It's just you remain more of a happier you know yeah. <laughs> happier yeah. and, and, and you're available accessible to other people other people are willing to talk to you you know and and you are you you know what what also happens is you start of becoming uh, you start realizing that in on this path this guy is going you become sort of omnipotent why can krishna see that arjuna is going to win this war even when before the war starts not because he is some kind of god now we afterthought is that he is a god but in reality he was a human there but a human with a deeper understanding of people's nature and that happens today too right you know if you have a deeper understanding of some problem 
you, they hire you as a CEO. They hire you at a higher position because you can foresee larger than a common employee in the company, isn't it? Uh, so that foreseeability, this omnipotence, you know, grows in you um, as a side effect, right? Well, but and I would expect that it's nothing that surpasses the common human abilities. Absolutely. Uh, so, yeah. right. So it's just, the, it's just, it's a huge, it's basically you just, start thinking better maybe or perceiving things better because yeah. you're no, no longer burdened with right. you know a lot, a lot of that suffering and you know unnecessary uh you know mind uh, that's what they call chitta chitta vritti right exactly. so um yeah so it's basically it's you're still human <laughs> you're yeah. not superhuman right yeah. um all right so, yeah. so that, that is also a distinction between gandhi's take on Gita and Aurobindo Ghosh's take on Gita. Aurobindo later on, even though he was a freedom fighter, he's, he realizes that this kind of getting the freedom from Britishers is only going to limit in our national growth. He was more looking at a society where all humans, including Britishers who were enslaving us, everybody, he wanted to create this whole thing called as integral human meaning you are open for everybody. And that kind of took him away from the whole independence movement into a much larger spiritual movement. Uh, so that was that's why I think Arbinda Ghosh is uh, much more relevant in today's society. Um, Gandhi is also quite accessible, but his take was more on solving the immediate problem, which was getting rid of the Britishers. Uh, from India. Um, so anyways, I guess, uh, Fred, did you want to have say something quickly? There's only one. Oh, it's, it's almost four o'clock. So if you want to wrap up, that's fine. No, no, you can go ahead, say, make your point. Well, this is <clears throat> gets a little bit off into the weeds, but I'll try to keep it short. <clears throat> um, he goes beyond uh, monism, which tries to identify <clears throat> uh, the self as belonging to effectively the entire universe and um, the, 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 the little the lowercase self identified with the uppercase self and in all, all aspects of matter, a kind of mon, uh, materialistic monism. Um, in 37, he says, uh, Arjuna says that changeless you, Krishna. Krishna is what is and what is not. Um, just quite a paradox, and, and there, this is akin to sort of a Hegelian dialectic, it seems, where you uh, you have to associate existence with non-existence. There, there are different ways of taking that. One is that that within every existent thing, there is sort of a seed of destruction, like in all life. Uh, uh, you. Uh, there is an awareness that you will die and there will be a deterioration. In other words, entropy and, and not just life, but in all matter, it's intrinsic to that matter that it, that it will dissolve. Right. The second way of taking it is, is that uh, Krishna is beyond the mere uh, concerns of existence and non-existence. No, no, no. So, Actually, no, the way to look at it, he says, thou art the immutable and thou art what is and what is not. So uh, Krishna is what you see. And there are certain things that your eyes cannot see, your eyes cannot perceive. That is, we may think that that is non-existible or non-existent, or, you know, the universe has come to a point where this is the reality. This is all that universe has given to this point. There are some interesting that are coming billions of years from now. That is also non-existent, right? And that is also Krishna. That is also coming out of the consciousness, right? So that's that's the that's how I read that. It's everything. Basically, the whole notion of uh, the clay potter, right? Potter and mm -hmm. clay and the objects that are getting formed is all one. That's the point. Over time, right? It, whatever you see as existing. And whatever has not come into existence, everything is the same, Krishna. 
Okay, good. That's that's sort of the interpretation I was leaning towards. That, that awesome. there, there's an element of time is runs throughout this, and so it doesn't matter whether it's in the past or the future. All those things are folded into into one. But that's uh, that's really good. Thank you. Awesome, awesome. Thanks, thanks for the questions, Fred and others. Thank you for an amazing session again. Um, Jason, you want to wrap up? Uh, no, you already wrap up. I'm afraid you already wrap up. You know? And I think this chapter is a good chapter. You know? I, I think, you know, I think. <laughs> yeah. But anyway, uh, thank you so much. And then uh, I, I believe you probably will do it probably monthly, right? R roughly monthly, right? Monthly, yeah. Uh, if, yeah. If we want uh, a little bit earlier, that's fine, but monthly. Yeah, roughly monthly. Okay. So anyway, uh, thank you, everyone. And then uh, uh, next week, we are going to uh, uh, have a short series. Of, uh, uh, we continue on an, another series called Chinese uh, uh, History. And we are going to talk about the Zhou Dynasty, the uh, first, uh, well, first civilized dynasty. <laughs> and if you read uh, Confucius Analex, and that would be important to understand uh, this dynasty. And Kwang is going to talk about this subject. Okay, anyway, uh, thank you everyone. And then uh, thank you, Sashi. And then uh, see you next week. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, Sashi. This was thank my you. favorite chapter so far. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Yeah.